Divorce TV with Wally Marcus. Our topic today, new developments in child custody with attorney Bob Barrasso. Support for Divorce TV provided in part by the Center for Divorce Mediation, 520-577-1202. Greetings. How are you doing? Greetings. Bob, welcome. Wally, good to good, see good, you again. Good to see you again, and welcome to Divorce TV. I'm Wally Marcus, your host of Divorce TV. been a divorce mediator for 26 years, and uh, our topic today is new developments in uh, child custody. My guest is Bob uh, Barrasso, um, who's a popularly known as Attorney Bob. I like that. Uh, he gives an, a nice uh, informal air, but also giving expertise. Uh, and you can get more information about our guest and our hosts and our program um, at the new developments in, um, at the website at the bottom of your screen. And also you can watch us on, on YouTube. Um, Bob, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, I'm a family law attorney. I'm a Tucson native. I've been practicing in family law for over 25 years. Um, I'm on the executive council of the State Bar of Arizona, the family law section. I've been on quite a few legislative committees, and um, I pretty much do nothing but custody and child support that's, in my practice. That's good. I mean, you do a, you know, a well-known in, in the Tucson area and well-respected, so it's I'm, always a pleasure having you on the show. I'm glad to hear that. And you were on the show, last time you were on the show, we talked about the child support guidelines, and you were working on the commission. And I know that takes a lot of your time. It's really admirable that you do that because you're really giving back at that point. Um, and if you want to watch, the, any of our viewers want to watch the show, it's on our YouTube site. And Bob did a great job and spent a lot of time on that. But can you bring us up to date on what happened with that? Well, yes, I can. In a nutshell, all of our efforts were rejected by the Supreme Court. Um, we were on a committee for almost two years. And if you did watch the previous uh, video or if you just kind of kept your eye on the news about it, they were proposing a drastic uh, revamping of the child support guidelines that were going to really change child support, especially in disparity of income cases. And um, towards the end, when we were about to pass the laws, there was a lot of opposition from a lot of different groups, and the Supreme Court decided to reject the new Cobbs model. And in May of 2010, they passed a minor revision of our old guidelines where they, uh, they changed the charts for inflation. And they did put in one, one sentence in respect for all the work that we did. And that sentence basically said that in disparity of income cases, the court can use that disparity to deviate from the guidelines. So the bottom line is there's not much new. Our child support guidelines are very similar to the ones that have been around for over a decade. Well, by the way, so our viewers know, what is the Cobb model? It was child Cobb's outcome, model. child outcome based support. That was the moniker that the committee had given to it. And um, as I said, they were really trying to look at uh, income models. And in cases where there was a poor custodial parent and a rich cust non custodial parent, that's when kids suffered, at least according to the studies that we had looked at, and they were going to attempt to drastically change that child support and make those uh, parents have to pay a lot more. I think part of it was the down economy, the bad economy, and I think the Supreme Court just got nervous about making really drastic changes that would require significantly higher child support in a very down economy. And so you think most of the people that were opposed to it were just because of the economic factors? Because of the work? economics, a lot of fathers' groups. There was a lot of fathers' groups middle-income fathers groups that had studied this, and they were really arguing to the Supreme Court that this would drastically uh, change their lives. Are we going to revisit it again? We have to revisit the child support guidelines every how many years? Four, every five years? four years, and uh, the model was talked about throughout the country, so I think that there's still some life to the ideas that were used, and certainly you can use some of that research if you are trying to argue for a higher uh, child support if you're a custodial parent in a disparity of income uh, case. Well, as I said, I think you did a great job trying to work on those things. It's too bad that uh, it all went for naught. But, it was uh, a lot of work. It was, it was a bit of a heartbreak to us on the committee that had done a lot of work. Yeah. I guess there's not much more to talk about guidelines. I mean, we're not going to close the show, though. We're going to talk about new, new developments in child custody. Uh, and I understand that there's a new Arizona statute, 25103, that gives parties joint custody. Is that true? Well, it's not quite true, but there is a constant um, maneuvering in the legislature, and there are a lot of people who want to have automatic joint legal custody, automatic physical custody. Those are mostly fathers' groups. And then there's a lot of groups that think that the court should look at these on a case-by-case -case basis. So recently there was kind of a compromise, and there was an amendment 
amendment to ARS 25-103 that basically says that it's the public policy of the state of Arizona that in most cases that there should be frequent, continued, meaningful contact between both parents and the children and that both parents should be involved in decision making. So that's as close as we've come so far to kind of an automatic joint custody law. Before I forget, we're going to put uh, Bob's uh, information on the screen, so if any of you have any questions, you want to get in touch with him directly or go to our website, you can do that. But there's Bob's information, his website, uh, www.attorneybob.net, and his phone number. So if you want to get in touch with Bob, and we'll put this back on if you want to get your pencils out or put your, if you're watching this on uh, somebody else and you want to put it on freeze, you can do that. Uh, I mean, you do a lot of custody work. I mean, what, what's your sense of percentage of couples that are, that you're doing divorce that either have joint custody or have separate or sole custody? Well, I think that the trend nationally over decades has been towards joint custody or shared decision making and lots of time for both parents. Um, I would say that probably just this based on my experience that maybe half of the cases now where there are minor children involved, there is joint custody. And by that, I mean close to equal time, joint physical custody. I would say in much more than that, there is joint legal custody, joint decision-making custody. Um, I think that a lot of research out there suggests that it's really helpful when both parents are involved and um, and dads have been very aggressive in the legislature and getting their point of view out. And so I do think that the atmosphere now is if you have two pretty decent parents that most of the time the court's going to award some kind of shared custody. Does the shared custody always have to be equal time, though? Or can, I mean, can you have the joint with the... Uh, I mean, when I mediate some of the cases, I, I find that sometimes the, the, the term joint or soul is more psychological than it is uh, you know, actual. That's true. I think the courts don't need to have it exactly 50-50. Sometimes the parent wants it to be down to the minute, but the court really likes to look at the schedules of both parties and really try to maximize the time with both parents. But I think substantially equal to me, that means anywhere between 40% and 60%. I think those cases were pretty comfortable calling those joint physical custody. But you could still call it joint even if it was 30, 70? Or... Sure. I mean, there are two terms that need you may not... Want to, actually, you may want to just... Dis... Yeah. I mean, we get, we're so used to these terms that we do that. Maybe there you are. can quickly sort of explain what the legal terms are. And especially when we talk about the new proposal. So there are there is decision-making. So whenever people get divorced or if there's a paternity case, Case and you need to have a custody order, the order has to address who makes decisions, decisions about education, about religion, about medical care, those are the main areas, and then how much time. And so joint legal custody or joint decision making has to do with just that. The court will order that both parents have equal rights or have some rights about decision making. So they both may be able to make medical, medical decisions. They both may be able to make education it's sort of decisions. The way it is while they're still in an intact family. Right, in an okay. intact no, family. I think it's not a, not a lot of change at that point. And a lot of times they compromise. In mediation, you probably deal with this too. You might say, well, they're going to they're gonna have equal rights, but if they have a disagreement, since sure. mom's in the school district, she may make the decision about education. They, since dad may have more medical background, he might be a nurse or something like that, we might say that he gets the final say about medicine. So we can cut up the pie, but the main point if, of joint legal custody is the parents have to consult, they have to try to agree, they have to try to keep the decision amongst themselves, and then if they can't agree, then there's some kind of tie-breaking vote sometimes. Okay, and what about the other custody terms, like uh, legal custody versus physical custody versus sole custody? All right, so we talked about joint legal custody. The other version of that is sole legal custody, and if a parent has sole legal custody, they get to make all those decisions. But even then, we can Compromise. Sometimes we say mom or dad has sole legal custody, but we put in some language about you have to communicate with dad, you have to try to agree, give him some input, and only if you can't agree you get to decide. Um, so th the two terms with these compromised uh, meanings often don't become that important anymore, but a lot of times people do fight over the J word, we call it, and, and in the new statute they do try to get rid of that word. What are they calling it now? What was the new statute? Was it 
Well, there, there is a, a, a huge revision of the custody statutes, much like the guideline revisions for child support that is in the works right now by the ad hoc custody committee that the legislature appointed. And they're trying to get away from the word joint or sole legal custody, and they're using terms more shared parental decision-making and shared parental time. They kind of mean the same thing. If it's shared parental decision-making, that means just what I said about joint custody. Or if it's sole parental decision-making, then it's a lot like what I just said sole custody means. It's interesting um, on that one. Uh, how does the parenting plan sort of fit into the parenting plans fit into the to this? Well, the parenting plan has to address both. So um, whether it's in court or if you're trying to work this out yourself or you're doing it with lawyers, you have to come up with a parenting plan. And that parenting plan has to address things like what happens if the parents disagree about medicine. Let's say one parent thinks the other parent uses antibiotics too much. What happens if there's a disagreement? The parenting plan needs to address that. Um, the parenting plan needs to address education. Where will the kids go to school if the parents are in different school districts? districts. If one parent likes private tuition and likes uh, Catholic schools and the other parent doesn't, how do we address that? And then, uh, of course, the parenting plan has to address time. Where will the child be on Monday? Where will the child be on Wednesday? Um, where will the child be on the weekends during the summer? Things like that. All of those things need to be addressed. And I'm a firm believer that the more specific that they are, the better for most parents. That's good. Um... Uh, we start talking about new, but I, you know, we've sort of gotten a little bit back onto the old, but I guess we need that. And hopefully if we're going to try something new today and do overtime, if so after the show's over, we'll be able to do a little bit more that can, people can watch on YouTube. So if we go over, we'll be able to cover everything at this point. Um, does Arizona law about custody really need to be changed? Um, well, that's what we're debating in the family law section. Um, we're all lawyers, and we're one group that gives some input into this law. I think most of the lawyers and most of the judges believe Arizona law has a pretty good balance right now. Um, we have a pretty good balance that uh, lets the judges have discretion. There are um, some people, uh, and I don't want to get too generic about this, but some, let's say the father's groups and the mother's groups. The father's groups really want to take away some judicial discretion and really make it almost automatic that they get joint custody. That's, that, that's kind of their political agenda. And they believe that the judges don't do that, don't give them a fair shake. Then there's a lot of groups that, are, are, uh, that speak out for women. And one of the big um, uh, voices out there is the women who are the groups who try to protect women against domestic violence. And they believe that joint custody can be very bad in those kind of cases, that it's another way for men to control women. And so those groups, I think, want to take away judges' discretion also. They want to say, look, if you find domestic violence, and they want to broaden that term uh, to intimate partner violence, if you find domestic violence, we want to take away your discretion to give joint custody. We don't think you treat that seriously enough. We want to make sure that the judges treat that violence very seriously and protect the children and protect the person who is the victim of that violence. Often women, but sometimes men. Before we forget again, let's put your information back up on the screen if you want to get in touch with attorney Bob Barrasso. There's his website and his telephone number, and um, he'll be happy to get back to you. So do you think the system is broken or not? Well, I... I think there's always going to be a problem when um, you take uh, intimate choices of a family. A family's very private. Uh, our Constitution protects the fundamental right of parents to make decisions about their kids. And, and when they come to the court, when they can't get along and they need the court's help, it's a rough job for the court to do. We lawyers are not trained in psychology traditionally. The system is made to fight, um, to, you know, a lawyer put on his side of the case and the other lawyer, lawyer put on their side of the case. So I, I think there's always going to be problems in trying to resolve uh, nasty custody disputes with the legal system, but but um, it's hard to dissolve a better system. So I wouldn't say that it's broken, but there's some problems with it. There's some problems with you know knock down, drag out fights in court, um, and 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 whether the judge gets it right in those because it's the color of your eyes, it's who cries the most, it's who was smart enough to call the police, and 
and and that can be rough uh, to do. It's interesting because you know I do mostly media, I do all mediation now at that point, and so we see a slightly different population where somebody will say he's a good father, she's a good mother, but you know I want to get divorced, and I guess when we do the co-mediation model, it does what you sort of said. My wife's a clinical psychologist; we mediate together, so we have the attorney psychologist and we get that input. So, you know, in some of those cases it works well, but it doesn't work for everybody, especially when there's all that yeah, anger. Yeah, and ideally, I mean, there's a lot of research out there that I'm sure you're familiar with. If the parents make the decision themselves with the help of a mediator, Absolutely. most of the time they tend to have ownership of it and it, they tend to not have to go to court as much. But you also run into cases where there really are irreconcilable differences, where the parents are drastically um, opposed to each other's view of what should happen in the custody case. In the news now, there's a lot about same-sex marriages. You know, I'm sure we're seeing, we're seeing marriages that way with also families at that point. Are you seeing any of that at all? Were there custody now, custody disputes or issues where you have a same-sex uh, couple? Well, Arizona law yes. does not acknowledge um, same-sex marriage, and so our custody statutes, um, we have in loco parentis statutes, which are kind of a design for grandparents, and they could be designed for same-sex couples that have lived together with a child. But there are no laws in Arizona that are designed to protect the rights of two parents, same-sex parents, who have an informal relationship with the child because usually that child is only biologically related to one parent. And the other parent who is not biologically related to the child, they have to struggle to stay involved in that parent's, in that if, child's if, life. If the people came from a state like Connecticut where, or some of the other states that allow same-sex marriage, like New York does now, got married there, have children, came to, you know, retired to Arizona or come to Arizona... <laughs> Well, there's, there's still the issue of the custody of the child because if the child is not biologically related to one parent, that is technically not a parent by our legal statutes, and um, that would have to be changed. Um, and, you know, same-sex couples can adopt children, and if they do adopt children, then they have equal rights if they break up, much like um, heterosexual couples. But um, typically, the same-sex couple will use one parent's biology. Often the woman will um, be related to the child, one woman and the other woman won't. Or if it's two men, maybe one, one man will be the sperm don donor, so he actually is the biological father. And that's the problem, is one parent's usually going to have stronger t traditional parental rights because of biology. Yeah, unless maybe they're, they go, each, have a, each have a child... Uh biological child. Yes, there have been couples where they each got a sibling donor, so both children had both genes, but again, only one parent was the biological parent of one child and one parent was the biological parent of the other, but it certainly encourages them to cooperate since they would have to split up the whole family. Um, you were saying you thought mediation was better in some situations. you want to elaborate on that a little bit or do you think you've covered it all? Um, no, I... I, I, I I've been to custody cases a lot. I try to do them with dignity, but there's a lot of invasion of privacy. Your psychological records come out, uh, your arguments that you've had. Anytime the police have been called, sometimes they bother the school, they bring the teachers in. So mediation is certainly helpful. Um, you want to try to avoid custody cases unless it's absolutely necessary, but sometimes it is necessary. Um, you hear a lot about war stories about the expense in custody cases. And I think when I was doing more of that, uh, I used to tell people, you really large retainers is going to be very expensive. Is it that your can experience? Be, it can be expensive. If people disagree on, you know, what what bedtime it is, what how the child should have her hair done, um, medicine, they can be in the court a lot. People can spend thousands of dollars and sometimes even tens of thousands of dollars if they fight over everything. And, and I really encourage people, and I sometimes use my uh, fees to encourage them, hey, is this worth fighting over? It's going to cost you thousands of dollars, and is that worth it? You might be better off saving that money for your child and maybe skipping that Friday dinner visit and not making World War III out of it. Um, is it possible, given the cost of that and other factors, for people to handle it themselves? 
Well, uh, I think I, I've heard that anywhere from 50 to 80 percent of the cases that are handled right now in Pima County Superior Court have at least one parent without a lawyer, and a lot of them have both parents without a lawyer. And with the Internet now, there are there is better information on the Internet on how to do it yourself. If you go to my website, there is a helpful links uh, thing on there. Let's, let's go back on there so we can uh, show it to them again. There we go. And on that website, on the helpful links, there is a link to the Pima County forms. There's a link to the Maricopa County forms. And there are free, extensive forms on everything from custody, child support, paternity. So you can do it yourself, especially if you're getting along. Um, it's quite possible that you do it yourself. But if there is hotly contested cases, if there's serious deficits like mental health, problems or violence problems or substance abuse problems, then you have to be more careful because you really want to be uh, careful how you present that evidence to the court to make sure the judge makes the right decision. Um, what other, you mentioned some of the resources, there's something called SALA? Southern Arizona Legal Aid, and they have a program, they are very limited in their funds right now because of the economy, of course. Um, but they will handle some cases free, usually involving serious domestic violence. They also have a lawyer's referral service where you can go and uh, see a lawyer for uh, um, a, a small fee. And then uh, occasionally, and they bug me to do them too, occasionally they can get a lawyer to take on a case, the Volunteer Lawyers Project. And um, I try to handle two or three of those a year where I just agree to handle a case for free, a hotly Pro bono. contested case. Yes. Pro bono. I, mean, I knew my junior high school Latin would come in. Pro bono, you bit. and I understand yeah. that, but they know they know for free a lot better yeah. out there. They used to say <laughs> when we were young, if you wanted to become a lawyer, take Latin. I took Latin. I didn't help too much. There so. you go. But yes, it's. It, I think it's important for lawyers to give back a little bit, and there's and a do, lot. Of, there's a lot of need out there. You do that. You do a lot of it, of course, both in both cases. So I wish more people did that. What do people normally fight about in custody cases? Well, the, one of the main issues is the, is the child going to live mostly in one home or 50-50. So that's one of the main things people fight about. Um, dads often want 50-50, and moms often want to have that primary custody. Another thing that the, uh, the couples fight about a lot in Arizona is relocation. Um, because of the economy, um, people lose their jobs, people are not deeply rooted in Arizona and they need to go back to New York and live with their parents or they can get transferred and get a good job in Northern California and the other parent wants to stay here and so what do you do? And, and those cases can be heartbreakers because uh, you can't split the difference. If one parent wants to take the child and live far away and they need a job and their parents are there, the other parent has to start visiting just during the summers or maybe just at Christmas. So those are cases that don't settle often and that we often will have a fight about. What's the interplay between that and child support? I mean, sometimes I, mean, I know people's motives are questioned on this because the child support does change depending on the the time spent. That's true. Well, one thing about relocation is you can't have equal time. If, if somebody's in New York and somebody's in Tucson, the court's not going to go month to month or year to year. So the parent that gets majority time is usually going to get more child support than there would be if there was 50-50 custody. What about local? Um, if well, they were, if they were just, you know, the couples are both in Tucson, um, husband, father and mother are both in if Tucson. If they are both in Tucson, the child support fallout is much different if it's equal time versus mostly with one parent. If it's joint physical custody, the child support is often not very much. If it's equal time and equal income, sometimes there's no child support. And they just split non-covered medical expenses. They split the insurance premium. They Do you think people, the though, that sometimes one party ends up pushing for the joint custody because they want to pay less child support? Certainly that is a motive. That is a motive. And the reverse is true, too. Sometimes a parent, it, when the kids really love both parents, they've both been good hands-on parents, one of the parents won't agree to 50-50 time because they want to be sure and get that child support. So I, I think you can see I hadn't some thought of it that way, but I can see where ways, it goes yeah. both ways. I never thought of that before, but I can, I can see where that would... Uh... If you want to use the stereotype, sometimes moms want to keep physical custody because they want the higher child support, and sometimes dads want the 50-50 because they don't want to pay child support. But I'd say most cases, people really are concerned about what's best for the kids. It's a tough potential question. You don't answer it if you don't feel comfortable answering. But, I mean, do you think that the, the parenting time should really enter into the, I don't know, and you must have looked into that a little bit on the child's guidelines, whether that, 
that the parenting time should enter into how much money is paid? Well, I think it should, um, I, especially when you're contrasting equal time versus primary custody. So if you've got two Raytheon engineers and they're both making 70000 a year and they're on a week-to-week -week schedule, then why should one parent pay child support to the other? They both have the same expenses, the same house. But if one parent is raising the child mostly and the other parent is having every other weekend, then five or $600 probably should go from one home to the other. What happens if you have sort of a low income, one parent's low income in the case of the mother and the father's a high income and they're 50-50 childs, 50-50 on the time? Well, that is one area where our guideline committee uh, and the Cobb recommendation, a recommendation that was rejected, really was going to change things. And these disparity of income cases where dad's making 100 or 150,000 and mom's making maybe 2,000 a month, uh, 24,000 a year, they were going to significantly raise that child support in joint custody situations. So if you do look at the numbers, even if dad's making a lot more money and it's 50-50 custody, he doesn't have to pay that much child support. And that was one area where the Cobbs model was going to change things. And now we can try to argue that you should deviate from the guidelines in those instances. How does alimony play into that kind of situation? Alimony is deducted from the parent's income before they run the numbers for child support. So theoretically, if there is alimony, we look at mom as having more money to pay, for, to pay child support or to receive less child support, and dad as having less money to pay child support. Would they, at that point, would possibly pay, give the wife more alimony or the mother more alimony? to compensate for the less child support in a 50-50 situation? Um, that can be the case. That certainly can be the case. And especially if the dad's making more money um, or the mom, the, the non-custodial parent, because the alimony is tax-free to the payor and taxable to the payee. So sometimes we may raise the alimony so that Uncle Sam gets a little less and, and lower the child support. I used to always like the alimony cases when we had a 90% uh, tax bracket. That's one of the advantages of the uh, high tax bracket which doesn't come into the political situation. We've got about a minute left, and I think we're going to try to go into overtime at this point so you can watch more and we'll answer more of the questions. So even though we don't get them all now, we'll get them a chance later. Um, what about situations where the, um, there's a, a drug problem or domestic violence or mental health issues? Well, let me talk about the one thing about, a minute. <laughs> about the intimate partner violence approach in the new ad hoc committee. They really want to broaden the idea of control and violence. They want, they're using the term intimate partner violence, and it's not just about hitting, it's not just about actual violence, it's more about emotional control, keeping people away from friends, keeping people away from their checkbook, um, kind of social alienation, and using that as a way to control the parent. And so the new statute is going to really broaden the definition of domestic violence to include intimate partner control type situations that may not involve actual violence at all. And that's important, but it's going to make the court have to look a little more deeply into the life of the parents. Good, Bob. Thank you very much. We're going to go talk a little bit more and we'll continue on to our just our YouTube frame. But I want to thank you for doing this. Um, it's always been a pleasure. It's always a pleasure talking to you. And we go, I said we are running out of time. Um, you can get more information about our program or guests or contact us at our website, which is at the bottom of your screen. And you've been watching Divorce TV with Wally Marcus and our guest, Bob.